You're listening to St Michael's Arts Festival Book Club with author Natasha Randall in conversation with Matthew O'Keefe. All events for the festival are brought to you by our sponsor, Ludlow Thompson. If you appreciate this podcast or any of our content, please donate online at stmaf.org forward slash donate. Thank you. Hello, Natasha Randall. Thanks for joining us uh, for a book club as part of the online St. Michael's Arts Festival this year. What is your what is your local connection, Natasha? I'm actually a, a resident of Stockwell. I live in Stockwell. I, at the moment, at this very moment, not living in Stockwell, just for a few months. But we, um, me and my family live in right in the heart of Stockwell. So we're usually great consumers of the um, St. Michael's Festival and we love coming to see the exhibitions and all things. So um, we're slightly missing everyone at the moment, but it is one of those strange times. So, I mean, not one of those. It is a strange time. It's, 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 it's the strange time of our times almost, isn't it? It really is. So your first novel, your first novel, did you write a novel when you were a teenager that you haven't told us about or is this actually your first novel? No, I have never finished a novel apart from this one. So I have a had nice a run at the novel is... several times, but I never uh-huh. really got far enough to make proper headway. And the, this is published last month? Published last month, exactly. By and, River and, Run. and during a pandemic and, and when no one was able to be present for anything, all online, you know, um, yeah. I mean, you know, no, no, no drinks, no um, fanfare, just a bit of Twitter and... <laughs> Instagram basically. That's meant to be the most difficult part isn't it? They, uh, lots of authors say oh, writing the book was one thing but then the hundreds of events I had to do to promote it was, was the real chore. To be honest in a way <clears throat> I'm kind of glad because I think I would have had a really hard time with all the in-person events. I mean I might have got used to it but um, I suppose the pandemic has brought out the introvert in me so I'm sort of uh, it hasn't been that bad really. I've done a lot of Zoom mm. events Instagram live things and you can have your glass of wine on your end you know that that doesn't need to stop well that's true I had initially wanted to I put on Stockwell Mums that I really wanted to have some kind of it because the book came out on September 3rd I'd have definitely had like a big drinks thing in Albert Square or Larkhall Park or something like that if I could have um for the community because I think it would have been really fun and a really good way of kind of getting some other there's, there are other authors in Stockwell and um, it would have been really nice to get everyone together for readings or um, creative writing workshops for kids. I had all these great ideas. Well, I'm sure that all of that stuff will surely feature as soon as you're allowed. It's, it's, a, it's a very active community, isn't it? And, and, and we can host some of it in next year's St. Michael's Arts Festival. Oh, that would be amazing. I think it would be really fun, actually. I think there's mm. definitely a lot of readers in Stockwell and definitely a lot of writers, too. So you, are you, were you born in London as well, or are you, where are you from? Okay, so here's the thing. I'm half American, half English. So I grew up in England partly, and then in America partly, and I really am sort of split down the middle. I have spent almost equal time in both countries, and uh, my mother's English and my dad's American. So I have a bit of an accent, yeah, so you can sort of hear something in my accent, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, a little, little, little something. But you also translate, you translate from Russian. I do. So my job for many years has been to translate Russian literature into English so novels mostly and some um, some poetry and that's kept me really busy but then I sort of shifted over to more critical work sort of essays and um, and now this novel. You're sort of 30 years away from being perfect spy material. (laughs) Yeah maybe (laughs) I I missed that I'm afraid (laughs) sadly I missed that boat completely. Damn, that would have been a very different novel you'd end up writing, I'm sure. I know, exactly. I'd have loved to, but anyway. So I want to ask you a couple of questions about, about the novel. Because I, I do, as you say, I think a lot of the people who listen to this either have read it or have just have ordered it and are probably waiting waiting to get their teeth into it. So we, can, uh, f- we won't give away too much, but um, for those people who are eager to he- hear a little bit more about the book, I wonder if I could just ask you about... Um, when and how you developed the sort of setting and plot for Love Ranger. I'm, I'm quite interested in um, how long that process takes and, and how long before 
you actually start sort of getting getting the words out does does that happen so i started this in january 2017 and i challenged myself basically just to get on with it and write something so I sort of tried to sort of sat there looking at the empty page for ages and then I was suddenly reminded that I'd written a sort of fictional fragment about 10 years earlier which I thought was supposed to be a short story and I'd showed it to a friend of mine um, and she at the time had said is this a novel this sounds like the beginning of a novel and I'd, it was hidden away in my computer I hadn't thought any more about it it was literally just three pages I didn't even really know what it was. But when I sat down again, thinking, come on, there was another novel I thought I was going to write, but I just couldn't get on with it. So I was like, this is this novel's not happening. And then I suddenly remembered this old fragment and this friend of mine who'd said, this sounds like the beginning of a novel. So I dug it out of my files and there was basically one of the first scenes of Love Orange, which is this family sitting around the table talking about mathematics and um, a little bit beleaguered by a sort of technological presence mm -hmm. and um drinking um cups of what was cups of tea actually in the first book but is now water um slightly more americanized yeah um <laughs> so i had this fragment and i reread it and indeed i found that there was this sort of very alive set of characters that really had already sort of um, come to life on the page. So then I just thought, well, why don't you just write your way out of this fragment? What happens next? And I spent basically most of the novel doing that, saying, what next? What next? I didn't have a plot in mind. I didn't have a story in mind. Um, I didn't have an ending in mind. I did the most uncomfortable thing you can do, which is I sort of wrote into the void. Yeah, you wrote, you wrote yourself a, a, um, a trap to escape from, really these sort of developed characters are all interacting with one another in, in various different ways. And, and you have to try and spring out from that. Well, exactly. So you're right. I mean, basically, I wrote them all into a corner and then just tried to see what they do about it. Um, and as you know, the book sort of follows, it's from four points of view. So it's the two children each have their point of view and then the parents. And um, they see they sort of pass the baton between them and the plot progresses, but you, they sort of pass the story one to the next. Perhaps more than four because Father, Father Brian gets his little, gets a couple of moments, doesn't he, as well, from his sort of private world and and in fact some others i suppose they no sorry you're right father brian does get a chapter when he goes to visit um to the prison so as you know the plot's about a mother in this the mother and the family is writing to a prisoner and their correspondence sort of opens up a whole can of worms and all the family members all have secrets and they all feel sort of trapped in certain um abstract constraints right so that nothing's really constraining Apart from possibly hmm. this smart house that they live in, there's a sort of there's a, there's a large scale comparison between the, John's life, this prisoner's life in the actual prison, and obviously Jenny's life in in the the, the symbolic prison that that is this sort of high surveillance household. Exactly, exactly. So she feels a real um, connection with him in terms of just feeling confined or trapped. I mean, sort of like what we feel now. It's a very sort of pandemic-y book in that way, you know, the way people have felt trapped at home. Mm. So in her case, she's not confined to her house, but somehow the house is very confining in terms of her place within it. And also this very, um, it's sort of Alexa Plus, the house, right? Mm. It, it does all sorts of things like makes coffee and stuff. It, makes coffee, it orders the milk. It, it, it one by one takes away all the things that Jenny's sort of learnt to do. But at the same time, it doesn't really remove her role so it, it sort of undermines her role by reminding her what she ought to be doing slightly I mean there's a, that sort of goes on in the sense that when the house tells her that the washing machine cycle is finished she's basically being ordered by the house to go and put the washing into the dryer <laughs> um, okay yes the yeah. house will order milk if it tells you it, you've run out of milk but also you know it doesn't really help her to know that she's, you know, she could go to the shop herself and the house becomes some kind of unhelpful analogue of her. Um, it also serves somehow to highlight quite how domestic her role is as a mother and wife. So you, you have children, you're, you're a mother. I am. And I know one's not supposed to have favourite children, but I'm <laughs> sure you have... 
a favourite of, of Jenny's sons. I, I do have a favourite amongst Jenny's children. And I think it's probably quite clear which one, though, because <laughs> one of her children really is the sort of wise innocent of the book who says everything that no one else seems to be saying or um, knows things that no one else seems to be conscious of. So he, I mean, he's a very special character. And I know that uh, all the readers that I've met have been so fond of him too, just because he's such a yeah. kind and sweet person. His brother, unfortunately, is an adolescent. And I think it's harder to render. Well, it's not harder, actually, at all. But um, in this case, um, his brother is much more consumed by tech. So we see a little bit less of him, um, whereas the younger, the younger Luke is so um, is so innocent and um, less tech obsessed, so more available fictionally anyway. Yeah, I definitely uh, um, found myself identifying with some of the, some of the, some of the wants to do uh, sort of experiments and just categorize bits of matter uh, and things like that, and I, I definitely uh, felt I remembered being quite like that myself. Right? I mean, child. it's not that odd. I think, um, you know, one of the issues in the book... Yeah, why, to, why does Hank make it out to be so odd? I guess because it's it's he's so um, assiduous in his, in his ordering. So when Luke has these sort of order of items that he does in his playroom, he orders them according to processes and industrial processes and all sorts of things like that. I think Hank just finds it alienating because it's not the kind of boy he was maybe and he's wondering mm. whether I think actually what I was really trying to hint towards is the sort of pathologizing of children how we see strangeness or shyness or um, maybe a child is a late bloomer and we're very swift to rush in and try to find that to be a problem and possibly to diagnose it. Um, while I understand that diagnosing can be extremely helpful in some situations I also worry uh, I think in Luke's case, it seems like everyone sort of wondering if there's anything wrong with him. And in fact, he's the least wrong headed of the whole lot. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the pathologizing that that idea, the pathologizing of, of children, I suppose that, that would have worked in a character the, the, the other direction. So if one of these boys had been incapable of sitting still for you know four hours a day and and learning in, in that kind of environment and instead wanted to be outside doing those sort of maybe those hankish uh, pastimes, he, he would also himself attract some kind of diagnosis. Absolutely, likely. absolutely. I think there's a lot of boy behaviour that gets misinterpreted or mis misdirected possibly. Certainly in Hank's case, so the dad, Hank, who's obsessed with his... Um, he's trying to figure out really his role in the modern world. Um, he's been told he has to be a deconstructed male and he's pretty angry because he'd rather not be mm. deconstructed. Um, and he's wondering what, how to teach his children how to be in the world because he's got two male children. And um, therefore, that also comes into play massively. So there's the pathologizing of children, but then there's also the ha what do fathers and mothers contribute to their son's self of sense of gender? Because gender is a really big theme in the book. As you know, certainly, yeah, and and Hank's gender is, is obviously very important to him, and and you can sort of you can feel that he's he's trying to, as you say, define his own gender role, and he seems to be caught somewhere between hunter gatherer and you know doomsday prepper. Um, in the, he wants to go out and do these traditionally masculine activities and and pass them on to his boys, but they aren't really his pastimes. And what what he seems re really interested in is sort of building this bunker that would take away all threats altogether. I'm just going to ask you about Jenny. It feels like she's traded her personality for uh, the roles of wife and mother. Uh, or rather, she feels like she's traded her personality for those roles. Um, but and and now some elements of those things are are sort of dissolving themselves. Um, we've we've touched on how the the smart home, as you say, it created an analog of of her the domestic responsibilities, um, and and because she's finding it harder to connect to her sons as well, th these things are compounding. Um, she she speaks of herself as a facilitator, um, and there's a there's a quote uh, like was it like the oil between the cogs or something like that? Yeah. A woman smeared along the paths of action. 
Yeah. And it, it's almost as if she's faded into such insignificance well, it, that she feels like she has, that she's not really even the protagonist in her, in her own a life and more a spectator. I mean, yes, there's a um, huge question in the book, really, about agency, about how much we really, well, choice, how, how, how our choices... I mean, is there really such a thing as a choice? So do we make choices and do we know what the do we know what we're doing when we make a choice? Do we necessarily know the consequences? So in Jenny's case, she gets married, um, which feels like a sort of natural act, although in the book she describes not feeling that comfortable in the process of getting married suddenly, as she realizes. Um, but also she um definitely feels that she had an identity placed upon her as mother and wife that eclipsed who she was. And she was only in the process of becoming when she had those labels placed on her. And they seemed to completely obscure who she might have been. And she's not quite sure who that was, but she's definitely feeling confined to her roles. Do you think this is a, a sort of common problem in contemporary society? I'm not trying to draw you on anything too political, but is this? It, it, do you feel that you're writing this for the, the many sort of Jennies in this position? I mean, um, yeah, it's something I've certainly observed. I've certainly observed that mothers seem to do duplicate work. I mean, uh, here's a sort of image for you. One long street of houses and flats, and in each flat and each house, the same movements are being duplicated at 6 p.m. every day, which is bedtime, bath time, cooking this, solving a squabble, helping with homework, putting to bed. And every woman along that road, it, ad infinitum, is doing the same thing. And it's mm. a lot of work. And it seems that community has left mothers stranded in the nuclear family. To me, it seems that way. It seems to me that though the nuclear family is sort of I mean, I'm we're talking heteronormative here. We're not talking, you know. I mean, mm. I must. I got to qualify everything I'm saying, really, because. Uh, but in the heteronormative sort of tradition, this nuclear family has been very damning for women. I think, um, and I don't mean that motherhood is a is a damning thing. It's just the way that motherhood is confined or quarantined, or actually the way that motherhood is placed in our society um privately name, yeah namely in the nuclear family i mean i think it's come out particularly in the pandemic i think mothers have been hit the hardest they've had to take wage cuts they've had to give up their work they've had to really pick up all the slack that the pandemic has thrown at them and i think it's been exhausted but exhausting and i but i do think that it shines a light on the problematic nature of this very sort of these 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 little pods of families that we live in. I mean, what I'm saying is community is important, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, community has its limits in the way we live. I mean, in the book, obviously, everyone goes to church. And I think that was my way of showing showing the family and community where they're still sort of isolated. You sort of go there. It's almost a performance, um, a family performance when you go to church. So the existence of religion in the novel has more to more than just a representation of of uh, the traditional sort of uh, institution which backs up the nuclear family and and the institution itself of marriage. It's it's also got that the the positive spin of being a representation of a, of a community living. Yeah, I mean, actually, there the community is kind of intact. I mean, people in that community really do go to church, so that's kind of interesting. But I think. Um... I wanted to show eventually how the priest kind of missed what was happening um, in mm. that there's still a sort of patriarchal blindness in the church to women. And I think the only way I really ended up showing that was when I showed the priest giving his sermon and having to say that basically Mary, the mother of Jesus, only really speaks twice in the whole Bible. And each time she says something really just about one sentence. And if you think about the role of her role and uh, what she represents, um, the fact that she's so unheard was mm. to me very striking. Yeah, and there's that 
uh, look at all of the many sort of almost anonymous, almost blended together, uh, Miriam's, Mary's and Maria's and stuff like that. Is, uh, that that was a, a strong parallel there with with the, that fading insignificance that, that Jenny herself feels. Exactly, exactly. So it sort of strikes a chord. I mean, and also I think, um, I, and you know, I, I did bring in other elements in order to point out that, of course, what I'm describing is a life of privilege, really, to some extent. They, they're not... The, they are, these aren't people that suffer <clears throat> any economic deprivations or um, particular prejudice. So they're doing okay in the scheme of things. Um, I was sort of keen to provide context to that by introducing other people in the book, um, some characters of color and um, some other people that live slightly differently. Mm. What the novel achieves in doing is is pointing out that the privilege of one type says very little about sort of the quality of, of life and, and sort of happiness, the search for happiness and fulfilment. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I do think that um, you can just get a little bit trapped in your own decisions. I think there's that happens to most people, that there's a sort of blundering that goes on, um, including, you know, the people in the book who commit crimes, they've often committed them by accident. Um and then you could even say that so many crimes that are committed on purpose are sort of consequence of other circumstances. Well, that's I, I'll pick that up in, in two directions then, because earlier you mentioned that one of the things the book's about is can we really make choices? And there is an almost a kind of uh, an anti some conception of free will uh, present at sometimes in the book. There's a strong ethical dilemma at the heart of it, really, which is, is it who we are that defines us or is it what we do? And, and, and they have, there's a discussion over that, I think, at one point. Um, what, if you lie, you're a liar. If you steal, you're a thief. And the rebuttal is, n- n- no, you're not. Um, and it, it, it's sort of this sort of really key metaphysical, ethical dilemma. Where do you stand well, on yeah, that? It's or so you... interesting because you're the first person that's really brought that up. I mean, the first person in any kind of official capacity because... Um, the reviews didn't really pick up on that and I'm just really, really glad to hear you say that because, yes, um, I, I mean, how am I supposed to explain this? So, yes, there there are massive ethical discussions in the middle of the book um, and I blame it all on Russian literature, <laughs> basically, <laughs> because, you know, you have to understand, like, from a, in, in terms of literary heritage, I come from, I translated Dostoevsky, I worked on a Gogol project recently, I've really translated and worked with texts that are all about this kind of thing, about free will, about how much do we actually... I mean, I I don't really have a divine element here at play. Um, The book isn't a book of faith, Um, but it certainly points to um, um, superfluity, so being superfluous, wondering whether your life actually matters. Uh, wondering whether what you do has any real significance or relevance or if you're just, as you say, fulfilling a role, Um, then in all that, essentially what we're talking about is an identity crisis as well. So there's really at the heart of the book is um, is a a real... Identity crisis is a big feature of all the characters. Um, um, But I don't think I answer any question particularly definitively. I think I just sort of have managed to write a book where these questions are brought to the fore. I wanted to sort of put forth how things can unfold and to point out that um, there are different perspectives on the same situation. So that was sort of why I took the story into each of the characters' lives in turn was was sort of so that you could see the family from each of those perspectives. So you didn't just get Jenny's perspective on her life um, as a wife and a mother. You also got the children's perspective, where they sort of glancingly saw what she was up to, um, but didn't see it from her point of view. But um, it was a fine balance. Honestly, writing the book was a really fine balance between juggling everyone and giving them their time and also um, making sure that, that I 
got deep enough into each of them mm. by the end of the book. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a triumph of character, really. Um, and so do most, mo- most other reviewers. So you must be very pleased with that. Um, I am. I, I worry that it's a book that um, men will have trouble getting into after a while, maybe because of Hank. But maybe you can tell me if that, how it felt to be male and reading it. Well, I mean, H- Hank was a really irritating figure for me. He 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 was infuriating as just one of the worst examples of of a feeling which you recognise, but that which it, you ought to really have integrated successfully, you know, in a way that he obviously has not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, although I have to say, it's not his behaviour is kind of bad, but it's not the worst. I mean, there are people that behave worse than he does. It's true, and maybe that's another echo of the of the privilege point. You know, it, 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 he's still a good. Is he is he a good father? Perhaps, perhaps yeah, he's not. He's still he a good a, guy. He I mean, he's, by all accounts, he's, he's a still good a good guy. Yeah. You know, he yeah. he takes care of his family's health. He's worried about them, their security. He goes to his job, and he, um, well, he thinks he's helping his son by war- taking him to a therapist. I suppose. Um, I think he thinks he's um, toughening his sons up a bit on the camping trip. I think he wished kind of wanted to do something good maybe he didn't achieve it that's the sort of hard part i mean i know he's a really he's a really really unlikable character and nobody nobody likes him and i, I totally get it i mean you know uh, it was a risk up, to write he, such it was a risk to write such a such an unlikable character because people that can cause people to stop reading if mm. you're not careful like yeah that. i think he, he, he picks himself up and he, he redeems himself by the end of the novel and um just about he's, he's, yeah just about he's more that you see him in the hole, perhaps that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but earlier yeah. you earlier you said um, that the characters become trapped somewhat in their in their decisions or mistakes. What what is fundamental to that is is the inability to communicate properly. I guess so. I mean, I also wanted to have tech being the confusing factor. So the thing that technology is doing in their lives, which you know, in hindsight, I feel like I could have done more of even, uh, is it's it's confusing the matter. So the technology is sort of getting in the way of communicating right so mm. instead of someone saying hey um we've run out of milk oh, okay i'll i'll are you going to the shop or shall i or whatever the house is saying it anyway or mm. you know and then like the teenagers on his computer all the time and um both parents are in their phones as well and i think there's a lot of te- there's a lot of communication that's not happening because technology has gotten in the way yeah the micro interactions uh uh, when they go, uh, what they are often the the kindling which starts a proper conversation, you know, or, and and then develops relationships. So it's when they go, and when they go on a larger scale, as you know, if if the whole uh, suburb had this, this kind of smart home, no one's going to that. What might be a sort of you know the shops area, and and this 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 uh, is has got sort of gained quite a lot of currency. This idea um, over the last few years, the sort of worry that. If everything goes not face to face um, onto the machines, then um, uh, we might sort of do worse at, at community building together, which is an incredibly prophetic thing to have written before the lockdown ever happened. Yeah, but I mean, it was all there. You know, it's all there. Uh, it seems to me that we can all we often are in the in a room together, but we're not there. I mean, I'm certainly guilty of that. If I'm on social media sitting next to my children I am actually inhabiting social media I'm not in that room I'm not present in that room I'm not present cognitively or even sort of consciously my consciousness has been sucked into my telephone really and so you can be in the same house in the same room but essentially these days there's a Spend there's a dearth of presence. People aren't present to each other. It seems to me, and it fe- it feels like it's the undoing of this nuclear family. So you have these nuclear families, but every no one's really there. Everyone's sort of stuck together, but no one's actually there. Mm. So it's a sort the of nu- there's everything that it it could be. It isn't anyway. The the, the nuclear family itself was. This was something I, I've written down you know, when when reading. So the whole the whole the setting is is in the shadow of this nuclear power plant, right? I thought there was something deeper there rather than just being the double meaning of nuclear in this sense. There's because it's it's sort of the background of uh, of it's portentous, isn't it? And it is kind of this invisible 
poisoning going on of the of the ground as sort of the radiation and it, it kind of provided for me anyway all the way through I just had this kind of toxic hue mm. to the to the area when reading um and I I, I, I suppose was that it, was, it's a, it was a sort of metaphorical I mean I, I didn't really do it consciously but to me it's it's, it's on sort of now that I've finished the book, it re- it to me it sort of rings as sort of a metaphor, which is that nuclear energy is the future, but of course everyone's afraid of it. But it's meant mm. to be some of the cleanest, uh, one of the cleanest forms of energy. So there's the sort of good and the terribly bad about it, which is sort of the whole metaphor for technology. That technology is essentially progress, but it it may be on our undoing it just like a nuclear plant it might provide clean energy but actually at what cost um and it's this sort of the good and the bad of progress i suppose um and and as you say nothing actually comes of the nuclear power plant it's really more just a hotly debated thing medicalization sort of that that might be on that list as well of things which are sort of ostensibly good and and prov- progressive but but it needs to be handled with care you know, it's hot. Yeah. I mean, to me, these are all manifestations of, of being sort of stuck in choices. So you've progressed, you've taken on these new technologies, you've you've um, gone down the route of pre- prescription drugs or developed new drugs. And in each of these things, there are, are opportunities, but there's also tremendous curtailment of freedoms, especially when you're talking about um, opioids, of course. Um, which which uh, which are a direct I mean a direct analogy to freedom and love versus the entrapment of addiction. You know, addiction mm. addiction in the book comes in several forms, right? So it comes in the form of technology, but also obviously eventually drugs. And the way that happens is obviously we're not going to give up. We're not going to give away that plot point. Um, but um, it's still the opioids themselves are a very, very fascinating phenomenon in that the feeling you get when you take an opioid is one um, that's been mostly described as one of love. So of being loved or of being in love. And mm-hmm. so when you have withdrawal from opioids, you have the most awful and terrible feeling of heartbreak and pain. And so that your normal life becomes a life of heartbreak and pain and you are constantly in this sort of terrible, terrible search for love and um, comfort in that addiction. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, is there, there's a reason why it's sort of taken hold. It's like the chemical version of the reliance she, she also seems to have on 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 the, the marriage she's in, on the family she's in, she she keeps she's still there even though she has sort of come to a, a opinion that it's it's bad for her. Well, I mean, the thing is, she's a mother, so she loves 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 her family, right? She loves her family. So as trapped mm. as she might feel, she her Achilles heel is that she can't turn her back on them. She cannot escape that prison because the prison she's in is the prison of love. Well. That was very nicely put, Natasha. And uh, on on that note, I think I'll, I'll thank you for uh, the conversation today. And uh, well, thank I'll you te- so much. And when I may, I just say that one thing I do love about Stockwell is it has a very intact and lively community. So this is not a book about Stockwell, I may say, because actually, <laughs> um, it really is the, the the most intact community I've found in my life, nearly apart from some very some academic communities. So. Mm. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be a part of the um, St. Michael's Festival. Fantastic. Well, uh, uh, everyone listening, make sure you get your copy of Love Orange uh, from all good, I suppose, all good bookstores. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, and equally, I've, I've promised a few Stockwell book clubs that I would uh, do uh, Zoom appearances. So anyway, do get in touch if you want me to. Yes, your get in touch. Up. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That was brilliant.